And the first company for today is Drone Shield Limited. Drone Shield has an ASX code of DRO. Drone Shield is an Australian US publicly listed company focusing on RF sensing, artificial intelligence and machine learning, sensor fusion, electronic warfare, rapid prototyping, and MIL spec manufacturing. Presenting for the company today, we have CEO and Managing Director, Oleg Vornik. Oleg, welcome back, and please take it away, sir. Thanks for having me, Manny. Drone Shield, as many briefly mentioned, focuses on taking down drones used for nefarious applications. Our counter drone systems, which is a combination of hardware and software today, are protecting Ukraine against Russian drones. And more generally, we're deployed in about 70 countries around the world across military, law enforcement, border security, and critical infrastructure applications. US is approximately two thirds of our revenue as of last year, where we're deployed in every branch of the US military, apart from the Space Force, and we'll probably get into the Space Force eventually, as well as a number of other high profile US government users. Today, we're approximately a 150, 150 person company, heavily engineering focused, so over 100 engineers within that team, mostly based in Sydney, about 140 out of the 150 people based in Sydney. And that is also where we design our products and also manufacture. So all of our manufacturing as well as R&D are done here in Australia. And also we use local Australian suppliers for as many parts as possible. We only go overseas for components which are not made here. For example, chips and batteries where we go to US suppliers. And with that, we'll step into the presentation. Slide, please. We're close to releasing our second quarter results now. So this is all existing public information, first quarter results for the March quarter. So you see we already started by the end of March with a strong growth in revenues for the year compared to similar period last year. Drone Shield generally runs on a fairly seasonal basis. So first quarter tends to be the slowest for us because of the Christmas and January slowdown, which affects government procurement as well, and then builds up to generally a very strong December quarter. We run on December year end, as that is fiscal year end for US government agencies, usually across October and November. So there is end of year spend as well as start of next year spend. So this year, for example, in November, December, we'll be seeing 2025 new year spend. So as of March, 31st of March this year, we have done significantly increased revenues compared to the uh, the previous year. And also every year of our existence has been record year. Just to put it in perspective, when we began, there was really no counter drone industry to speak of. People were asking, well, why do I need something to detect and take down small drones. They are what I buy from our children for Christmas, right? And then eventually the sentiment started to change as bad guys around the world started using the drone technology. And of course, drone technology has a vast number of positive applications, but also negative, and we're focused on that nefarious element. So as the bad guys around the world started using all of uh, all the drones to conduct surveillance attacks. Uh, Houthis, for example, are taking Saudi oil facilities back around 2018. Uh, and then uh, U.S. military started to get under drone attacks, which was actually the first time for a very long time when U.S. military was not having air superiority as drones started to command that sort of mid-air segment. The customer focus turned to acquisition of counter drone systems. Then, of course, Ukraine happened. And as much of a tragedy as it is, it has really highlighted the need for both drones and counter drone solutions. As the military planners around the world are saying, in any future conflict, while drones do not displace the traditional methods of fighting war, such as tanks, frigates, planes, artillery, Drones are a disruptor, so you can have a $5,000 drone blowing up a $5 million tank, 
In fact, a statistic I saw is that more Russian tanks have been destroyed through Ukrainian drones than using dedicated traditional ways of defeating tanks, such as Javelin and Enlor uh, shoulder-fired missiles. Tank, uh, drones can also be used for surveillance. So in the old days, you might send a human scout to figure out location of the enemy. Today, you don't need to do that. You just send out a drone that can report on enemy position movements, and then you can do artillery attack or position your strategy accordingly. And of course, worst case scenarios, the drone might get shut down, which is of course no big deal compared to a scout potentially um, losing their life. So Ukraine has really highlighted the need for these counter drone solutions. And so the military planners are saying, okay, well, we now know that we need counter drone systems, but we have very little of it just because the industry is so new. So compared to traditional defense material, whether it's bulletproof jackets or tactical radios or something else, things that existed for a long, long time and militaries already have a whole lot of these things. Sure, wars increase the demand, but fundamentally there's plenty of stocks of these things. Counter drone equipment is so new that nobody has nowhere near enough of these things. So we estimate there is less than 1% market saturation in terms of the militaries who have the equipment versus how much they actually need to have to adequately protect against drones in any conflict. And now if you move off the military into more civilian sectors, so drones attacking uh, airports, for example, so it doesn't need to be a military-style attack. A drone can simply fly around the airport and then no traffic, no planes can come in or out of airports because there have been numerous studies that shown if a drone is ingested into a plane, engines, you're going to blow out those engines. Unlike birds, drones contain metal objects and lithium-ion batteries, so you're going to blow out the engine and potentially take down the airliner. So it's it's quite a significant threat for airports. In prisons, people deliver contraband to prison windows, Amazon-style drugs, weapons, escape kits, cell phones. People cross borders with drones carrying drugs and also doing surveillance of border agents. So there's quite a significant amount of civilian applications as well. And all of that demand is, is growing as well. Although militaries leading the way is usually is the case with any new technology. So strong demand, but very little existing base of use of counter drone systems. So militaries over the last several years have significantly tested systems. They certify them. Uh, there's been all kinds of uh, bureaucracy that's needed to deploy systems by the military. For example, those of you following us may have seen NATO framework agreement that we have signed several months ago to enable NATO militaries to purchase our equipment. So all of that is now creating significant demand that we expect to translate into continuous strong revenue streams going forward. So strong stream of revenue growth, cash receipt growth, and then last year, so as I said, we're running December year end, um, we have turned profitable as well. Slide, please. The next slide gives a bit more basis for what I just said in, in terms of the detail. So in terms of how the business works on cash basis, when we build a piece of equipment, it has about 200 line items of various components. So it takes us about three to four months to build it. Then when we sell it to customers, US and Australian government pay on net 30. So we deliver and we get paid 30 days after. For customers outside of tier one, so US or Australia, usually we demand payment before shipment. So we don't take credit risk. And this especially goes for Middle Eastern type customers. And uh, as a result of that, we don't have any amounts overdue owing to us by, by our customers. We have a strong cash balance. So as of 31st of March, we had approximately 171 million, having raised about 115 million through placement and SPP that we ran a couple of months ago. And majority of the uses of the funds is towards that inventory for the fourth quarter anticipated sales. So it takes about four months for us to 
to build the products and users often have urgent requirements. So even though their order might be large, they're only prepared to wait maybe a few weeks. If you say to them, it's three to four months uh, for us to deliver equipment, they'll say drone shield, you are our first preference, but we'll go to somebody else if that's how long it takes because they have requirements to ship it to Ukraine or maybe somewhere else. And so as a result of that, we need to have a lot of equipment on the shelf. The good news is it's a very significant gross margin reflecting the highly differentiated nature of our equipment and high degree of IEP that we have. So this inventory position then turns into a very significant amount of net proceeds once sold. 27 million contracted backlog, pipeline of 500 million. This is off uh, 31st of March. So as I mentioned before the end of this month, we'll give an update for the June numbers, approximately $400 million current manufacturing capacity. So we do a bit of manufacturing ourselves, but substantial majority of the manufacturing is outsourced to a highly capable defense electronics manufacturer based in Adelaide. And the idea is that we want to be great at doing R&D and having a little bit of manufacturing makes sure that we continue to innovate and understand what's involved in actual manufacturing. But then it's an entirely different skill set to actually be building, especially at large quantities. And also, we don't want to be settled with a cost base that comes with having our own manufacturing plant and what happens if there's a period of idleness. So we focus our resources on the R&D and letting somebody else do the manufacturing. So the outsourced manufacturer completes the build. They send the products to us. We load the encrypted software, which is the most sensitive step of the process, and then we ship it out to customers. Next point is the favorable environment for drone shield. So this is what I was alluding to earlier. Drones and counter drone equipment are clearly required in defense, security, and civilian sectors more generally, we anticipate going forward. And Drone Shield has established itself as Australian based global leader in this space. We started 10 years ago, right from the beginning of the industry. We used that time to develop the technology, develop our distributor network in over 70 countries around the world to establish relationships with end customers. And now all of that effort is paying off. Slide, please. We have two differentiators at a high level, technical and commercial. Technical differentiators is we are fundamentally an engineering company with a little bit of commercial layer on top. So majority of our staff are hardware and software engineers, and we are very good at developing artificial intelligence, hardware and software to detect never seen before drones. And artificial intelligence or AI is a very frequently used term. Seems like nowadays everybody has AI something. So what does it mean when I say AI in the counter drone application? What we're seeing now is there are significant ongoing advances in the drone sector. In fact, for certain drone brands like Autel, the Chinese brand, we're seeing convergence of military and consumer technologies where we're seeing pretty fully formed military electronic warfare techniques inside of what are supposedly consumer drones. So in order for us to detect, track, and counteract those drones, and we counteract through jamming, so you, you essentially send a signal in a smart way that disorients the drone and neutralizes it, and a drone that is essentially using military-grade techniques to resist such detection and, and takedown, you need to be able to have substantial amount of data for how these drones operate in the spectrum and then ways to detect never-seen-before drones. And you need dedicated hardware for that software to run on. So that's what we mean by AI. We started doing this about five years ago when we gave up on a library-based individual drone-by-drone -drone fingerprint approach. And we moved into this AI basis where we started accumulating data. So we now have, we believe, the largest database of its kind in the world of drones in different environments. And that, uh, that enables us to uh, continue building our 
algorithms to improve. And we do quarterly software updates as well as hardware refreshes every couple of years uh, to keep up to date with advances in, in drone technologies. In addition to the AI and the radio frequency space, we have artificial intelligence in computer vision. So started with our work with University of Technology Sydney. So that's using third-party camera hardware to enable the cameras to find drones, lock on them and start tracking them against complex backgrounds. And now camera has been doing this for humans and vehicles for decades. But the complexity there is you have a dinner plate size object being the drone, flying at 20 meters a second, weaving in and out of complex background like trees or urban environments such as buildings. So ability to be able to consistently track it against the background is fairly complex. And again, we have significant data sets and complex algorithms for us to do that. And finally, the third AI technique that we use is sensor fusion. So for on the move and fixed site installations, we use constellations of sensors. There might be radio frequency sensors, radars, cameras, maybe acoustic sensors. So when you have different modalities of sensors in different locations, and they identify a drone. Some of them might say, well, this is not a drone. Some might say it is. In the detection and tracking, it's very important to have minimized false alarm rate and maximized probability of detection. So we use AI to achieve that sense of fusion and accurately report the drone to the operator. So these are all the technical differentiators we have. And on the commercial front, so over the years, we developed trusted relationships with government and military users in over 70 countries around the world. And often when there are new drone advancements coming out, our devices with users' consent are able to send us that information back or we get verbal feedback from the end users describing the threat. And we can use that to continue improving our algorithms. So having that global network of intelligence that continuously streams to us and enables us to update our technologies is a significant advantage. And then in turn, these end users feel like they have sense of ownership in our technology and then they buy our systems versus other people. When it comes to government and military, it's usually not the approach to shop around every time. You would notice, for example, there's only one F-35 plane, there's only one Abrams tank, one Bradley fighting vehicle. And that is because militaries prefer to find a technology they like and then continue working with those manufacturers to continue driving advancements in those technologies. So that's what we're now enjoying with our end users. Slide, please. Pipeline, so about $500 million of opportunities across about 90 different projects. There are fundamentally two risks in the pipeline, P-GO and the P-WIN. P-WIN is a relatively easy one for us. This is if the project goes ahead, is it awarded to Drone Shield or a competitor? While most people expect that government procures via tenders, and it does, it's actually often an exception when it comes to military and security sector, because when you tender out a project publicly with a list of requirements, you give away a lot of sensitive information. So, for example, if you're looking for counter drone system to detect across so many kilometers, the adversary then knows that anything more than that, you might not be able to detect. So in order to keep that sensitivity then users are able to have exemptions from the normal tendering rules. So as a result, they can engage with one manufacturer that they like directly. So what we do over time is we work with our end users. We demonstrate our capabilities to them. We improve on a regular basis from their feedback and feedback from the other end customers. And then when it comes to procurement, we often get people coming to us directly as opposed to a competitive tender every time. So we're not very concerned about the P-Win being drone shield versus other technologies. P-Go, however, is a real risk. So P-Go in the government land, meaning the order being delayed, changed, every once in a while canceled compared to the original timeframes. And the way we mitigate it is we say we have over 90 projects on the go. It doesn't matter if half or two thirds of them get pushed to the right, you still have enough in order to have another record year. Slide, please. Majority of our pipeline is across US and Europe. 
and that's across numerous projects. So I would not say there's a geographic or customer concern. There is a geographic a concentration, yes, but not so much customer risk here because in the US, this pipeline is across dozens of customers and similarly in Europe. We've recently had our first dedicated European sales employee start with us. And the, and the idea is that historically, in order to conserve costs, we only had dedicated sales offices in Australia as well as in Virginia in the US. But And the rest was being done by distributed network in 70 countries around the world. But now as we're seeing demand for counter drones starting to explode, we are investing in small but very capable own locations across Europe and then eventually in time, Middle East and South America. These are not expensive offices. They are, they are highly experienced sales employees often working from home and then going to and customers for demonstrations. Slide, please. I'll largely skip the slide, but the point here is we started about 10 years ago, which gave us time to develop the technological and commercial differentiators. And now we're seeing the demand for counter drone explode. Slide. And again. So we started about 2014, we're a 10-year-old business, listed on ASX in 2016, hardware and software solutions. Military today is majority of our customer base, but over time we expect civilian sectors to add to that. We earn revenue in three ways. Vast majority of sales now are hardware, and then we have SaaS on top of that. So when you buy majority of our hardware pieces, and over time it's going to be every hardware piece the drone shield sells, you have a percentage of hardware cost that you pay every year in your software subscriptions. So think of it a bit like antivirus. You want to have quarterly updates to the artificial intelligence engine to be able to continue to be as accurate as possible to detect and track drones. As people's lives depend on the technology working best it can, we have good amount of customers enrolling in those software updates. And over time, we expect software to be as close to half of total revenues as possible. And then the last revenue stream is our electronic warfare work, which is also focused on detection of never seen before objects with the Australian government. So now we're going through a two year, $10 million contract that runs to mid-2025, and we expect continuous large work after that. Addressable market is about US $10 billion, and that's across military and civilian sectors. And as I was saying, the really exciting thing right now is less than 1% market saturation exists. So the industry is so new that the customers that purchased so far have very much been early adopters, and now is the time for mass deployments. Slide, please. Three families of products, handheld systems last year that contributed majority of our revenues, RF patrol for detections, it's cell phone size detection product, completely passive, doesn't give away any emissions, about one kilo weight. And then once you detected a drone coming at you, it will tell you direction that it's coming from, it will give you basic information about the drone. You can have options of either taking cover if, if you don't want to get detected, or you can take one of our drone guns out and, and jam the drone down. Second family of products is Drone Sentry X, now in the Mark II, the second generation. So it can be on a vehicle, on a ship, on a rooftop, a versatile product that is a combination of detection and defeat. And then we have third family of products, Drone Sentry. That's a multi-sensor solution involving radio frequency, radars, cameras, acoustics, jammers. And across all of this, you have underpinned command and control systems, tactical as well as fixed side, that can show you outputs from all of our sensors on one pane of glass. All of the IP you're seeing on that slide is drone shields with the exceptions, small exceptions of radar and camera hardware. There are plenty of people that make great cameras, great radars, so we, we don't rely on those. 
slide please three steps to the uh the process so detection assessment and uh response the response can be evasion can be figuring out where the pilot is we can do that uh or or jamming and i think that probably comes close to the end of the presentation i can see many popping up which is probably my cue uh, step uh, and, and ne next uh, next slide please um and let's uh let's keep scrolling through i'll see what else is there that's worth updating this audience on and slide and I'll probably finish off on the competitors. So in, in Australia, we are the only company with a complete range of detection, defeat across handheld vehicle and fixed site solutions. Majority of our competitors tend to be either integrators or people that make individual components. And the quality of those tend to be nowhere near as high as ours. So because of that, we are not particularly caring about competitors. For us, the biggest challenge are newly emerging drone technologies themselves and keeping up with them. And I'll stop there before many jumps in. Uh, Oleg, thank you. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, it's a it's a fascinating business. It's uh, very exciting and 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 uh, I think you I think your share. It's fair to say your share price has certainly reflected that. So uh, it's been a phenomenal performance, and congratulations! Uh, we do have a uh, we do have a few uh, questions that have come in, uh, so let's get through some of these. If I don't get to all of them, though, or we'll make sure Oleg gets any questions that we don't get answered, have time for, um, and he can answer those separately. So uh, the first question, and there's a couple of questions around the same issue, around the, around the same point, I should say. Um, it, the question is, Oleg, can you talk a little bit more about your view on of counter drone tech in civil society in, in, in the future? For example, uh, sporting events and concerts and, and airports, et cetera. Uh, I know a lot of the focus of today's Prezo was military, but... Can you talk a little bit about what some of the potential is there in civil? Civil is going to be an absolutely huge market. Airports, stadiums, and much more data centers. The challenge with civil sector to now has been it's a very reactive space, meaning until you have an absolute tragedy, <clears throat> the end users don't tend to do much about it compared to military that tends to be quite responsive to threats. So my, <clears throat> my forecast on this is eventually sector by sector within the civilian space, there's going to be a tragedy in the airport space. It might be an aircraft coming down <clears throat> because an engine is blown out because of the drone in a prison space. It might be because somebody delivers a loaded handgun into a prison window using a drone and then there's a mass shooting inside a prison and at that point there will be a swift change in legislation where just like fire control systems are compulsory across all venues counter drone systems will be compulsory the great thing about civilian sector compared to military is that the customers don't need to hold cards close to their chest. So if an airport deploys a counter drone system and they like it, they're going to be telling this in detail to every other airport because they don't compete with each other in the way militaries obviously do. So once there's a high profile incident, there will be immediate demand for one high-end systems and military performance requirements are higher than civilian. So if you're good enough for military, you will be good enough for civilian. And two, somebody that can deploy systems in large quantities. And for us as a company, a lot of focus in the last six months in particular has been about large manufacturing volumes. So we have been watching civilian sector very closely. And once we start seeing the ISIS moving, we believe we'll be very well positioned for it. Okay, great. Um, <clears throat> okay. Uh, the next question is around and you've touched on this during the presentation a little bit, but it is asking if you could elaborate a little bit more on on what uh, on your competitive advantage, um, given that there are some pretty big players in the space in the anti drone space already. Can you elaborate a little bit on what on what that competitive advantage is, and uh, and how you uh, in, uh, it, anticipate staying ahead of that curve? So first, I'll start by saying defense 
primes are not our competitors. In fact, they are usually our customers because when governments often purchase, sometimes they purchase directly, but sometimes they purchase through acquisition funding vehicles, which primes control. So they would direct prime to buy directly from drone shields. So defense primes are our friends. They're not competitors. The culture and the mindsets of defense primes are longer term very large projects as opposed to really nimble industry like counter drone where you need software update every three months hardware refresh every two years and that's also reflected in the nature of employees that defense primes have so we don't compete with large defense primes when it comes to call it mid-sized players like ourselves and also smaller players i would say a couple of things one the industry is no longer garage industry you cannot have a start up overnight with a couple of people and somehow get a lead there's an the low hanging fruit is all gone right so in the in the first several years of counter drone industry it was good enough to take existing engineering knowledge from another industry like roadside bomb jamming or cellular jamming or or detection of other objects applied to counter drone and you're done we're now at a very cutting edge technology situation where there is a lot of genuine cutting edge research that needs to be done that has never been done before in any industry. Drone Shield has developed a really agile culture over years where we're able to achieve things technologically over time that most people simply cannot do in anywhere near same amount of time. We also have, as I mentioned before, a network of relationships with global customers, which means when there are new unusual drone techniques emerging, we find out about it before just about anybody else does and in a more comprehensive way than anybody else can. So almost like global way of collecting intelligence on new drone techniques that enables us to respond better than anybody else. Uh, so ultimately, it's all the hard work that we've done over the last 10 years on technological and commercial front, having been there from day one, as opposed to somebody who tries to jump in today. Um, so Oleg, thank you very much for your time today and um, have a great weekend. We'll get you back soon. Thanks for having me, Manny. Take care.